Welcome back to Madden Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing eukaryotes part one, especially for the bio portion of the MCAT exam. If you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash madmedicine, you can find a playlist for the biology portion of the MCAT exam, where we're going to be posting brand new videos regularly, so you guys can use them to study for the MCAT exam. While you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our, uh, to our channel, folks, because again, like I said, we're posting regularly. We would really appreciate your support. Thank Thank you so much. And with that being said, let's talk about the structure of this lecture. Today in part one, we're going to be discussing the general information about eukaryotes that you need to know, as well as the types of organelles. This is very high yield because the test writers for the MCAT exam like to test you. So this is high yield as fuck. H-Y-A-F. Definitely, definitely understand what happens in each of the organelles in the eukaryotic cell. Part two, we're going to be discussing the cytoskeleton as well as high yield MCAT facts and questions. So stay tuned for that video. With that being said, let's talk about the general information for eukaryotes. These are types of cells that contain a, a membrane, um, they contain several, excuse me, membrane bound organelles. And they also contain a true nucleus and a linear DNA. Now, this is all very, very important. I highly recommend you guys write this down, commit it to memory. Just don't forget this. Uh, the fact that eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles, they have a true nucleus, as well as linear DNA is very important because it differentiates a eukaryotic cell from a prokaryotic cell. Again, very, very important. Now, there are six main types of organelles with specific functions you need to know for the MCAT, okay, and these are the nucleus, mitochondria, lysosomes, proxosomes, endoplasmic reticulus, reticulum, excuse me, and the Golgi apparatus. All of these are very important. We're going to talk about them in a quick minute. Now, all of these organelles chill within the cytoplasm. Now, the, these organelles that we talked about are all bound by a membrane, hence why they are called membrane-bound organelles. These organelles are bound because it allows our cells to compartmentalize their function. Very, very important because depending on the organelles you're talking about, you either want to prevent the internal uh, contents of that organelle from going outside or you want to prevent the external contents in the cell from going within an organelle. The reason why is because some of these contents within an organelle can be very toxic and you don't want that organelle exposing other parts of the cell to its contents. And because of that, we have a membrane that binds that excuse me, binds these organelles, allowing them to remain separate from every other organelle, essentially with uh, within its function. Now, this organelle uh, these organelles are bound by something called a phospholipid bilayer. We're going to look at it in a second. Essentially, you have a hydrophobic head which repels water, right, and hence why it's called hydrophobic. And then you have a hydrophilic tail, two of which actually, that uh, uh, attract water, uh, and together they create a phospholipid bilayer. Now, the cytoplasm essentially is located both within and outside of the cell. What I mean by this, and this can get very confusing, is that within the cell, right, you have the cytoplasm, and within the organelles, you also have some liquid. Essentially, it's not the same cytoplasm that is called the cytoplasm, but what I'm trying to say is you have liquid within the cell, uh, and, which is the cytoplasm, and you have some liquid within an organelle, which I'm just calling the cytoplasm for uh, making it very simple for you guys to understand what is happening. This is what a membrane looks like, the phospholipid bilayer. You have these heads right here, the, phospho, uh, the hydrophobic heads, and then you have this phospholipid tail, the hydrophilic phospholipid tail. Okay, essentially what this does is on the outside it repels H2O. It tries to come in, but it gets bounced off. But if H2O is right here within the phospholipid bilayer, it's going to be good. It's going to be Gucci. You can chill there. It's all good. Now, we call this a bilayer because the hydrophobic head and the hydrophilic tail uh, are two times, well, there's two of them, right? That's why we call it a bilayer. There are two layers of uh, uh, the membrane. And that is why we have uh, membrane-bound organelles bound by, hydro, uh, sorry, bound by phospholipid bilayers. Excuse me. Within the phospholipid bilayer, you also have many other things, as you can see in this photo. You have some channel proteins that allow for the diffusion, uh, either active or passive, and you have some cholesterol molecules and much, much more. We're going to talk more about uh, the phospholipid bilayer in depth when we get to the biochemistry portion 
of the MCAT. So let's talk about the nucleus. From now on, we're going to be discussing specific uh, organelles. So we're going to talk about the nucleus. This is the control center of the cell. Most likely you already knew that because this is pretty common. This is very common knowledge. Just a quick recap. It contains all the genetic material and it's surrounded by a nuclear membrane or a nuclear envelope, whatever you want to call it, which is a double membrane that maintains a nuclear environment separate from the cytoplasm. Now remember earlier I said that the reason why we have uh, uh, a membrane-bound organelles, we have several membrane-bound organelles in eukaryotes is to protect the negative things from going within a, a organelle and the negative things from going outside of an organelle. Well, in the case of a nucleus, because you have genetic material in the form of DNA within the nucleus, you don't want to get damaging things coming within uh, the nucleus because if those damaging things come in and affect DNA, you can have mutations which are bad for the most part, right? So you don't want to do that. That's why we have a double membrane. The nuclear pores are also present, though, because you don't want to have just a membrane that contains the DNA and that's it. Nothing else can happen. Because you want still some sort of exchange, we have these things called nuclear pores in the nuclear membrane. Now, they allow for a selective, very important, it allows for a selective two-way exchange of material between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So essentially, if this is your nucleus, you have this pore right here, essentially bad things will not be able to go in. They'll get bounced out. But good things will, will like uh, uh, trans, uh, sorry, neurotransmission uh, molecules, molecules that induce gene uh, transduction, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be able to go in to play an important role on the DNA that is within the nucleus. So you are selecting what goes in and out. Very, very important. This is a photo of a nucleus. You also have a structure in the nucleus called the nucleolus, which we're going to talk about in a second. You have the uh, nuclear envelope right here, and these areas are the nuclear pores. So let's talk about uh, DNA. DNA contains all the coding regions called genes, and it's located usually in the nucleolus, except during replication. The reason why is that the nucleolus is where all the uh, a condensed form of DNA usually is. Okay, so usually you're going to have the chromosomes right here. Now, when DNA has to go through replication, obviously it can't be condensed, so it's going to be out here. So usually that's a very confusing concept, but I'm just trying to simplify it for you. This is the nucleus, okay, and then this is the nucleolus. All right, rRNA, ribosomal RNA, is also synthesized in the nucleolus, and DNA is then bound in a linear fashion and is supercoiled around histones. This supercoiling actually allows us to have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell. It's better to just look at a photo of this for you guys to understand. This is the DNA you guys are used to, right? The 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 double helix uh, that you know we have seen growing up. Now, obviously, DNA cannot be in this form all the time because if it is in this form, in this unraveled form, it is going to be gigantic. It's going to take, up, take over the whole cell and nothing is going to be able to get done. Hence why we have this supercoiling of the DNA. First, you have these normal coils and then you have some supercoiling occur. All these supercoils pretty much occur around molecules, around proteins called histones. And because of histones, we're able to condense our DNA into chromosomes and essentially lodge them within the nucleus. Now, when uh, certain genes have to be expressed, when certain proteins need to be transcribed and translated, uh, you're going to have... Uh, uh, a decondensation, you're going to have an unraveling of that portion of the DNA. Okay, so not all of this, all of this material gets unraveled to uh, to uh, to cause an upregulation of a gene. In fact, the very specific location where a gene is going to be upregulated usually gets uh, unwound so that the gene can be expressed or a protein can be transcribed and translated. That is very important to understand. Most of the time, it, uh, DNA is going to be condensed. That is a nucleus. Next, let's go on to the mitochondria. And you've heard this phrase a lot, whether in memes or uh, just in the class. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and it is because it plays a very huge role in producing ATP. Essentially, that's mainly the main thing you need to know about the mitochondria. It has two layers. It has an outer membrane, which uh, 
acts as a barrier and it has an inner membrane along with some folds called the cristae where the electron transport chain goes down. Very important, electron transport chain is going to produce ATP. Okay, we're going to talk more about the specific details as far as how it does that in the biochemistry portion, but just know electron uh, transport chain, ATP, it's all happening in the inner membrane. Because you have two layers, you're going to have two spaces. You have the intermembrane space, which is just the space between the two layers right here. And then you have the matrix, which is the space within the intermembrane. So it's easier to look at a photo of this. So I'm going to give you guys a crude drawing. And then later, we're going to look at a microscopic, uh, electron microscopic video, uh, photo of a mitochondria. So this is what a mitochondria looks like, essentially. This is your outer membrane. And then you have the inner membrane right here. But within the inner membrane, you have these folds that occur, okay, every so often. And that is very important because that is what we call the cristae, okay? And in the inner membrane and within the cristae is where the electron transfer chain is happening. So it's right, right here. I'm just going to draw an arrow to this. This is the intermembrane. This area right here within the intermembrane is the matrix. And this is the intermembranous space. Very, very important. So that is what a mitochondria looks like with my crude drawing. Let's talk a little bit more about the mitochondria. This is a semi-autonomous organelle. Essentially, other than the nucleus, this is the only semi-autonomous organelle you need to know about. It contains some of their own DNA and genes. And the important thing to know is this DNA is actually circular DNA. We're going to talk about this in a second, but this is circular plasmid-like DNA. It replicates independently of the nucleus via binary fission. And what should all this remind you of? Well, it should remind you of a prokaryote, right? Because you have circular uh, DNA and replication via binary fission. Well, the reason why I'm bringing all this up is because we thought and we think currently that the um, uh, mitochondria was actually a prokaryotic cell that was engulfed uh, by an anaerobic prokaryote. Okay, that's essentially what happened. And when it engulfed the prokaryote, we got these membrane bound organelles within a eukaryotic cell. That's how eukaryotes got created. So essentially, the mitochondria can be considered a pro prokaryotic cell within a eukaryotic eukaryotic cell. It is, other than the nucleus, it is on, the only other organelle that's going to contain DNA. Very important. This actually comes back in medical school, believe it or not. We got tested on this. Now, the mitochondria also contains an enzyme called cytochrome C. Very high yield, very, very high yield, because again, this is something that's going to come back in medical school. Definitely something you should be very well versed with. High yield. In fact, this whole slide is pretty high yield. So don't forget any of this stuff. Okay, so the cytochrome C molecule plays a very important role in apoptosis. Essentially, if the mitochondria gets damaged, okay, if the outer membrane gets damaged, cytochrome C will be released from the intermembrane space. That's where it is. That's where it's chilling. If it gets released, it's going to induce apoptosis programmed cell death. Very, very important. This is what a mitochondria looks like. Right here, this outside portion is your outer membrane. This inside portion is your intermembrane, uh, your inner membrane, sorry. Between these two right here, you have your inner membrane space, okay? These are your cristae, and as you can see, this is, it's this folding of the inner membrane. And then everything right here is your matrix. And you can just look at this photo for a little bit and figure out what's happening. Let's move on. Lysosomes. Lysosomes are very, very important molecules in the cell because I consider them to be the garbage men of the cell. They contain these hydrolytic enzymes that break stuff down. They play a huge role in recycling nuclear material and um, recycling proteins and amino acids and just breaking down uh, viruses, etc. So very, very important. These uh, lysosomes have a membrane that keep these enzymes from killing the cell. Essentially, you can actually induce apoptosis by damaging the lysosome itself because the contents within a lysosome are so cytotoxic to a cell that if they get released, you'll go through apoptosis. Excuse me, they'll, you'll go through apoptosis, and often a cell will actually induce apoptosis by lysing the lysosome itself. And that's what we wrote right here. It can be released for apoptosis, the contents. 
Peroxisomes are very similar to lysosomes, except that they contain hydrogen peroxide. Very, very important because it is uh, uh, very important for oxidative burst. It plays a huge role in preventing uh, uh, certain types of bacteria from attacking our body. And it is very important, hydrogen peroxide. It also metabolizes waste along with lysosomes. So I always consider peroxisomes to be very similar to lysosomes, except they just have a little bit more stuff that they can do. Lysosomes mainly are the garbage men. Peroxisomes are a little bit different. They're a little bit more specific in the things they can do. They play an important role in beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids. Again, we're going to talk about this when it comes to the uh, biochemistry portion. And they, uh, they participate excuse me, in the synthesis of phospholipids. And they play a huge role in replication because they actually play a role in the production of the phospholipid bilayer because they are synthesizing phospholipids. Endoplasmic reticulum is a series of tortuous membranes that are connected to the nucleus. This is going to be the only organelle that is connected to the nucleus. So it's very, very important. Now, within this organelle, you have a subdivision. You have a rough endoplasmic reticulum that contains ribosomes. Remember, ribosomes are little tiny uh, uh, organelles that are going to produce protein. So they play a huge role in protein production. And because they are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum during on the rough side of the endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to produce proteins. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, on the other hand, has three main functions. And can you guess why it is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum? I'm pretty sure you can. I'm pretty sure you already know this, but there are no ribosomes in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, hence why it is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the three main functions of the SCR is lipid synthesis, detoxification, very high yield, guys, very high yield, do not forget that, and protein transport from the rough endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. It's like a middleman between the Golgi and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So let's talk a little bit more about this protein transport by talking about the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus, in my opinion, is the post office of the cell. This is where everything goes down as far as shipping and uh, uh, packaging is concerned. Now things come from the endoplasmic reticulum in vesicles to the Golgi apparatus and then they are unpackaged. So let's just quickly review. You have the rough endoplasmic reticulum with the ribosomes that are going to produce the proteins. This uh, production is going to go to a smooth endoplasmic reticulum which is going to pretty much package them in a very crude and basic manner. And after packaging them, it's going to send it to the Golgi apparatus. And when it gets to the Golgi apparatus, the Golgi apparatus is going to unpackage the material that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum sent. It's going to modify the proteins that are in this package by adding either carbohydrates, sulfate groups, or phosphate groups. And after this modification, it's going to repackage them and send them to its proper location. Now, this proper location can be uh, within the cell or it could be outside of the cell. And if a product is destined to go outside of the cell in the extracellular uh, space, it is uh, destined for secretion, then the vesicle that the Golgi apparatus sends is going to merge with the cellular membrane and its contents are going to be released via exocytosis. That is the uh, action of just releasing its vesicle. I'm sure you guys know what it looks like. Uh, if you guys don't know, you can search what exocytosis looks like and look at a photo of uh, the pathway for exocytosis. Very simple. Now, it can also go to the cell. It can also stay within the cell, these, these, uh, uh, these products from the Golgi apparatus, and they can play huge roles within the cell as well. Now, this is what the cell looks like. Essentially, I would highly recommend you guys go through this slide, spend some time, and look at the slide so you guys have an understanding of what is happening. All the stuff is broken down here. It talks about all of the uh, uh, organelles we discussed today. And uh, just know that what we talked about went a little bit more in-depth than this, this picture right here. With that being said, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Your support means a lot to us because we're going to be producing these MCAT videos regularly for you guys. While you're here, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And thank you again for, for your support. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and continue on to the next video.